Thanks everyone for joining us. This is the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Wednesday webinar. Really excited today to revisit an old topic I think that we um, haven't chomped on for a while. Mechanical cultivation. Got a really exciting presenter joining us from Minnesota, Sam Oshwald Tilton. It's gonna speak first and then Justin from Burnt Rock Farm. And I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourselves further and jump it over to you, Sam. Thank you so much for joining us and taking the time today. Oh yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name's Sam Oshwald Tilton. Um, thanks a lot for Becky and Justin for inviting me out. Um, I've been doing um, uh, vegetables kind of all over the upper Midwest. I'm from Wisconsin. I went to school uh, out in Michigan and then now I live in Minnesota. Uh, I organized the Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day, which is a, a great excuse to come out and see demonstrations of all types of weeding tools. Um, and uh, I used to be a vegetable farmer, and and then uh, I went to graduate school for horticulture at Michigan State and, and studied weeding tools. And um, after that, I worked for Colt Cress, a German weeding tool company, and went around Europe and, and around the U.S. Um, helping farmers with weeding tools. And um, worked for UW Extension with vegetable growers, and now I work for myself. So, uh, so I am Glacial Drift. That's just me, and um, and so I help farmers um, solve weed weed management problems, whether through systems or tools. And uh, I can stop there. Hey, everybody! Uh, Justin Rich, Burnt Rock Farm up in Huntington. Know a lot of the folks on this call. I'm just the guy who's going to show some pictures of tractors and steel and see if there's anything that anybody's interested in uh i've gleaned a lot of information over the years from a lot of other growers it's always just nice to see pictures of other people's tractors and things made of steel and rubber um so appreciate hearing any advice any ideas anybody else has and then i'll show a bunch of pictures of our stuff so i'll hand it back over to becky and sam yeah thanks thanks to both of you um sam you can start screen sharing and while you get going i just also wanted to say we've built in plenty of time for people to ask questions and have conversations. So, and even if you have things, um, pictures you want to share of your systems, you are welcome to do that. So um, you can put things in the chat while Sam is presenting and we'll have lots of time for actual conversations. So thanks, Sam. Okay, thank you. Um, so as a title, I have Managing Weeds Through Smarts and Steel. Um, I think it's just kind of important, uh, and I'll touch on this in a few different ways, just to think about it's not just a piece of metal that's doing the weeding here. It's how we're using it, how we're mounting it, what the spacings are. Um, so to me, it's really smarts and steel that that manage weeds more than just steel. Um, and then uh, I, I work with farmers all over the country on kind of improving weed management. So if people ever want to talk more, there's my email and feel free to, you know, we can call or talk more, et cetera. Okay. Um, so um, uh, Justin and Becky asked me to talk for a little bit today, and I th I thought about what are the things worth talking about. It's early spring. You're not going to reinvent the wheel at this time. I don't think so. Uh, probably if you order a, a new weeding tool, it might take a while to get to you. They might not even be able to get it to this season. So I tried to think about what are some early spring tips for weed control that are kind of actually actionable um, now. So, so um, what I wanted to talk about, and I'll run through these in more detail in a moment, is um, checking your planters for accuracy, uh, checking your cultivators for accuracy, maintaining your cultivators and tractors, consider presetting the depth of your sweeps, plan a stale seedbed for less competitive crops, and consider your cultivation progression. So I was hoping those were things that might be kind of helpful and actionable, you know, now in the next, you know, month or so as things start getting in the ground. Um, so with that, let me, let me uh, say what I mean by that. Um, uh, checking planters for accuracy. You can see here in my Green Bay Packer colors um, some examples of what it means when either a transplanter or seeder is dropping plants or seeds dead on or when they're a little off. Um, um, you can only be as accurate as your rows are. And so even if you have a camera guided laser, weeder, whatever magic you have, um, if your rows are off or not parallel, then you're going to have to back off that row and you can't get as close. Um, so take the time to check your cedar and especially um, uh, and transplanters too. So the way that most of these things work, right, is we have a toolbar and we have the seeding or transplanting units coming off of that toolbar. So I would recommend two things. Um, one is 
um, pop a measuring tape on that toolbar and make sure that the clamps for those seating units or the transplanters are dead on exactly where they need to be on that toolbar, okay? Then realize that a lot of us are using seeders or transplanters that are 10, 30 years old. If they're planted junior units, they might be 70 years old. And so even if you have it lined up on the toolbar where you think you need it, something may have bent over the last 50 years. And so what can be really nice is pull your unit on your tractor either into your shed um, or, or onto a gravel surface or flat surface, concrete, even a sheet of plywood. Um, and after you've measured on the toolbar where things should be, on the ground, the business end where the seeds or the plants actually grow, go into the ground, measure what that is. Um, and like I say, I've, I've been on uh, a few farms where we go to cultivate and everything's just a little off and we wonder why and we go back to the cedar and something's just tweaked, you know, bolts loose or whatever. So anyhow, in terms of kind of spring maintenance, um, I would check your planters for accuracy. Okay, there's our stand power lock exclamation point. Um, thing is check, check your cultivators for, for accuracy. So hopefully most people on this call have a set cultural system for their plants, right? So whether your rows are three rows at 15 inch or four rows at 12 inches or three rows at 18 inches, whatever it is that's subject for another time. Um, but whatever that row spacing is kind of similar to your planter, um, make sure that your cultivator is set up exactly on there. So here's a nice picture from Josh Volk, just of a um, double diamond bar tool setup. And again, that's the principle that matters here. So whether your toolbars are rear mounted or front mounted or belly mounted, whatever, it's a similar principle. Um, so similarly, um, uh, mark on your toolbar what uh, what spacing your sweeps and standards should be at. One thing I really like is one of those paint markers, you know, that they didn't want us to have as kids because we'll graffiti all over, um, but they show up real well, you know, more than a Sharpie. And so on your toolbar for both your planter and your cultivator, it's nice to have those marks of dead on where things should be, because then during the season, if a bolt gets loose, something jumps, you don't have to always check it. You can just kind of see, hey, does it is it right on that paint mark? Um, so one thing is make sure those standards, those clamps are dead on exactly where they need to be. Um, and then similarly, you can see here in the, the bottom corner of this picture, I put a green line for what a straight standard should look like, you know, straight up and down. And here I put a red line just to kind of show if something were to get bent. So again, just like the um, I said for the planters, you might have something on the toolbar exactly where it should be, but the standard may have been bent. So again, it's nice to pull those setups into a shop, onto a driveway, concrete floor, piece of plywood, so you can check kind of all the way down from the toolbar all the way down to where those um, tools are engaging with the ground. Um, are they straight? Are they where they should be? So check your um, cultivator for accuracy. Um, consider presetting the depth of your sweeps. Um, one thing I like to do is what I call a shop adjustment of the cultivator. Um, so before I kind of take it out into the field for the year, um, I'll pull it into the shop. And the different things that I just told you about, about checking the toolbar, um, I'll do in the shop. Another thing that's nice, I think, it's nice to have a totally flat surface to set up your cultivator. Of course, it's not going to be that way in the field, although we do our best um, to make sure that we're dealing with a, a flat, nice seed bed. Um, uh, but it's nice to have everything set on a flat surface and start with everything equal. And then when we get out into the field, you can kind of make your tweaks, but at least you know that you're starting from a baseline. Um, and so what I like to do for setting the depth of my cultivators, um, so hopefully you can see my mouse here. Here in the corner is a gauge wheel. Um, so this is a parallel unit, so it's floating independently with the ground, and it's following this gauge wheel. So whatever the soil does, um, this sweep in the back is hopefully maintaining that consistent depth in the ground. Um, for me, um, a good rule of thumb depth for my sweeps, depending on the tool I'm working with, is three quarters of an inch to an inch deep. So that's not always, but a rule of thumb, you know, often true. I want my sweeps to be running three quarter um, to an inch deep. So what, what you can do if you're bringing your uh, machine into the shop for a shop adjustment is um, you can put um, a three quarter inch or a one inch piece of wood underneath your gauge wheel. So you're lifting it up three quarters or an inch and then drop that sweep all the way down onto the floor, onto the gravel, onto the plywood and do that for, for every um, sweep in your setup. And then you know that they're all set to an even depth 
um, and the depth that you like. And when you get out into the field, you can tweak them, but they're kind of all starting from the same space. Um, so that would be considered presetting the depth of your sweeps. Okay. Um, consider a false seed bed. I don't want to take too much time to explain the false seed bed technique. I'll, I'll hope that people are familiar with it. Um, but just to say, uh, a lot of people have, you know, calendars or um, processes for, for how they're going to get things in the ground. If you can, um, give yourself seven to 10 days for that false seed bed, which means take the time at the beginning um, to make that seed bed. But before you need to plant, give yourself seven to 10 days um, to let weeds germinate. And I would say the two um, things to consider are um, the job of a, a false or stale seed bed is to get weeds to germinate. So in the spring, that's usually not a problem because we have plenty of moisture. Um, but just to say, if you're using a false or stale seed bed later in the season, or if we have a dry spring, consider watering your weeds or irrigating your weeds. Um, so for some farmers, that's that's really worthwhile in terms of getting a lot of those weed seeds to germinate. So just keep that in mind. Whatever you're doing, you want those weed seeds to germinate. Some people might use a, a cola packer or packing wheels to pack down the soil um, so that the weed seeds have good seed to soil contact and they'll germinate, right? Because it's really hard to kill a weed seed. We have to wait till it germinates. Um, the other um, detail that I would point out about a false or stale seed bed is this one and a half to two inch depth, okay? So again, rule of thumb, not always true, but often enough true. Um, weed seeds will germinate within uh, the top two inches of the soil. And if they're below that depth, they won't germinate. They're incredibly smart. They can sense nitrate levels, oxygen levels, light levels, and they know, hey, I'm too deep in the soil. If I try and germinate, I'm not gonna be able to make it up. I'm just not gonna germinate. And the reason that that depth is so important is, uh, when you do your false or stale seed bed at a certain point, right, um, unless we're using an herbicide, we're going to till to kill those um, those uh, germinated weed seeds and then we'll plant, right? Um, if you till too deeply, you're going to bring up new weed seeds that will now germinate. But your goal in a false or stale seed bed is to work the soil within that top two inches so that you're getting most of those weed seeds to germinate Um already before you plant your crop. But if you till too deeply, you know, six, eight inches down um, after your stale seed bed to prep your seed bed, you're bringing up new weed seeds. So I would suggest um, try and um, try and uh, till the end of that um, false and stale seed bed at a, at a shallow depth so you're not bringing up new weed seeds, okay? Um, and just to say a false or a stale seed bed, here's the example of flaming, um, really works. So here's, uh, in Michigan and, and we had one of the um, burners go out and we didn't realize. And here on the right is an area that um, didn't get flamed and here on the left got flamed just before the carrots emerged. So just to say it, it makes a huge difference or it can. Um, and I know for a lot of people, especially in the spring, we gotta get stuff done. It's hard to make time for more passes through the field. Um, so consider making the most of your passes. So here this farmer um, has a basket weeder uh, mid-mounted and a jane cedar in the back. And they're using that basket weeder not to weed, but as a stale seed bed pass. So they're saying, hey, you know, I, I left as much time as I could before um, planting, seven to 10 days maybe. And now just before I'm planting, I'm trying to destroy any weeds that may have germinated. You're really trying to give your crop a head start. Um, and again, just to show that that false and stale seed bedding really pay off. Um, here's an example from, uh, from our friend Hans Bishop down in Illinois. Here on the left, um, he made two stale seed bed passes and you can see, see he still has a few um, grasses and lambs quarters coming up. And he made three stale seed bed passes. This is for his storage carrots. Um, and it was really worth it to him um, because carrots can, can really be lost to the weeds. And here's the final result um, before any hand weeding. And you can look through and there's maybe, you know, one or two lambs quarters, but they're very, very clean, which is just to say that um, the stale seed bedding technique can really can really help or put you ahead. Um, okay. And um, then the other thing I would say is consider your cultivation progression. Um, so some people just have one weeding tool and that's it. And you can maybe get by with that. Um, but a lot of people want to have several different weeding tools, or if they have one, they'll set it in different ways. Um, the general progression, I like rules of thumb that are kind of good enough, but they can always change. A general progression is that when crops are young, we are pulling soil away from the crop. And as the crop gets older, we're healing soil up to kill um, in-row weeds. 
Um, but whatever your progression is, just think about as your crop gets older, are you changing tools? Are you changing the setting of your tools um, to kind of match the condition as that crop gets bigger and can take um, uh, uh, a stronger, stronger tool? Um, so as, by way of a joke, here's um, a difference in cultivation philosophy, Europe versus America. So here's an American farmer and here's a European farmer. And we all know Europeans are classier than us, right? Uh, at least me. Um, and what I mean by that is we do have a difference in how we kill weeds. American tools generally um, kill weeds through soil movement, especially through hilling, right? Um, versus the, uh, European tools often kill weeds through cutting or uprooting. They're just more refined. But let me show you what I mean, and you can kind of see how this plays into um, the progression of your weeding tools. So these are a variety of what I would say are more European knives. Um, and you can see that they're incredibly flat. Like look at this bottom one, the rake angle is almost zero, right? Um, or these these T-blades, these slasher blades, they're really like, um, you can think of them as razor blades almost that are running parallel to the soil. And so their job um, is not to throw soil, it's not to bury in row weeds, it's really to slice weeds. Um, and the reason that that can be really helpful is um, probably two things. Um, these tools can run extremely shallowly, um, you know, say down to a half an inch deep or something. Um, and so one, if you want to do any type of um, stale seed bedding, you're able to run at that shallow depth without bringing up new weed seeds. Um, two, because they move so little soil, you're not throwing soil into the crop row. So for something like potatoes or whatnot, this is not very important. Um, but for something like carrots or other direct seeded crops, this can be crucial. It lets you get into the field a lot sooner. Um, so it's nice to have the tool in your toolbox of tools that move very little soil um, because you can weed the crop a lot sooner. Um, and the other thing is soil moisture, right? Especially at least for us in the Midwest um, with climate change, we're getting a lot more heavy rain events. And if you're locked out of the field, you know, until the top three inches dries out because that's as shallow as you can go, you're not gonna be able to get in the field for a while. Um, it can be really handy if you have the ability to weed very shallowly, even if further down is a muddy mess and you, you'd bring up a bunch of mud if you ran through that, being able to run really shallow and get in after rain events can be helpful. Um, so just consider um, how shallowly your tools work and maybe that's a tool that you wanna add to your toolbox. Um, and then about that, or similarly, think about how your tools are mounted. Um, so here on the right are normal Danish S-tines, which are a great tool. They're, they're really um, flexible in the soil. They can uproot weeds and they'll flex around rocks. It's great. But um, again, in terms of weeding and getting close to crops, they're not very accurate. They can bounce all over, you know, so their strength is also their weakness. Um, so one tool that a lot of growers are liking are what I call these vibro shanks. And so they kind of make the best of both worlds of um, a rigid shank that's really um, accurate, but if you hit a rock, it's going to throw your whole setup off or it's going to break something. And the Danish S tines, which are really flexible, but, but almost too flexible for, um, for really accurate weed control. Um, so these are, these, um, vibro shanks are another way that growers can get accuracy and also work the soil more shallowly. Um, another option are cutaway discs. This is on uh, parsnips, I believe. And you can see that, um, they get very close to the soil especially in heavier soils, like um, we'll have clay. You know how um, you might get close to the row and if you pull out sort of a clod, it'll pull out the crop in the row. And these cutaway discs do a good job of cutting the soil away um, and followed up by side knives to get really close to the row. Um, and then realize that other in-row tools like finger weeders, which I imagine everyone knows about, they're a fantastic tool. Finger weeders are part of a progression, right? It's this progression of tools. Um, so you don't want to run finger weeders just alone. So here on the left, you can see after we ran some cutaway discs, we've got a nice kind of raised mound. And here on the right, after the finger weeders go through, they're crumbling that in-row mound, uh, mound. And so what let the finger weeders do what they're good at, which is just taking care of the few inches right in the row um, uh, and have tools running ahead of them. Um, you know, just before we started, Vern was, was talking about tool stacking and how important that can be. So here's an example where um, it's nice to be able to, to run, you know, two or three tools at one time to really let each of them um, do the best job that they can. And so here's just an example of what those finger weeders can look like. Um, uh, up ahead, you know, we've got these side knives. You can see they're slicing a very straight line 
on either side of the corn, hopefully not going too deep. And here the finger weeders, all they're doing is crumbling that in row area. Um, and remember too, I've got this cabbage in here as a reminder. Um, I met some incredible cabbage farmers in Germany and they said, yeah, we don't really need finger weeders because if we hit our the timing right, we can heal the cabbage enough from transplant that we never need to do in row weeding. So just to say that all these magic pieces of steel can be fantastic, um, but really it comes down to timing. And, and the better that you can hit the windows when the crop is ready and when the soil is ready and when the weeds are small, that's more important to dictate how much success you have more than having the perfect tool. Um, and here's an example of these finger weeders showing um, uh, how, shallowly, how shallowly they can run. Um, so usually when I do a talk, I start with this big picture um, and then I go on to explain all the elements of that big picture, but, um, uh, but we don't have time for that today. But I wanted to take a moment to just say these early spring tips I'm giving you, just remember they're part of a bigger picture, you know, and to me, the most important thing um, for weed management is creating a size difference between the crop and the weed, um, having a low weed seed density, I'm sorry, a low weed density in the row and a low weed seed bank. And these are kind of ecological weed management practices that we could talk about for a long, long time, but not here. Um, and then the other, the other um, parts of the weed management picture are kind of metallurgical, but I think all of them are kind of intellectual. So I started this talk saying smarts and steel. Um, again, there's just some fantastic tools out there that help, but they all need to be used kind of in the right way um, and in the right sort of progression. Um, I'm gonna skip that for now. One book that I would really recommend to you if you're not familiar with, it's our tax dollars hard at work. Um, this is the uh, magnum opus of uh, Chuck Moeller over at Cornell and, uh, and his collaborators, is this book, Manage Weeds on Your Farm, A Guide to Ecological Strategies. Um, you can get it for free. To, just type that into Google. It's, uh, the PDF is available for free from SARE, and probably Becky or Vern or other people can get you a hard copy. This is the best um, uh, print resource I know of for, um, for ecological weed management. And the, the beginning of it is, you know, everything I told you and more about um, tools and techniques, but the, the second half is, is what's really important. And they have individual chapters on each type of weed uh, and telling you about their life cycle and the weak points in that weed's life cycle so that you can really target it through the depth of your tillage, the timing of your tillage, all sorts of other things. So I can't recommend this book enough. Um, so I'll, I'll stop my sort of official talk there. Um, and I think uh, I look forward to hearing Justin's talk and I think I'm hanging around for questions, stuff like that. So I'll stop there, thanks. Sam, thank you so much. That was a really um, impressive and excellent overview. Um, and I also think that book, uh, I think I, I like what you said where learning the, life cycles and ecology of the weeds is such a great fundamental to the management and can kind of like build out the strategies and tooling from, from there. So thanks. Do folks have any questions for Sam right now? You can unmute and talk if you want. Sam, I guess I have one question. Do you um, recommend any resources on the stacking setups? Any? Um. Well, I guess this wasn't the answer you're looking for, but I guess I, I primarily recommend caution. And I what I mean is I think people can get excited about the latest and greatest and newest in weeding tools. And I think if you're if you're already using weeding tools and you're comfortable with them, stacking can be great. And that means running multiple tools um, in the same pass. So for example, you could be starting with maybe um, side knives, then maybe you could be running finger weeders behind them. And maybe even behind them, you have a little over the road tine weeder. Um, but I also see growers kind of rushing too fast and maybe spending money on tools that they don't have the time um, to learn about well, um, or getting a, a, um, getting ahead of themselves and getting a tool that, they, that they're not able to make the most of. So I guess what I would say is before you get excited about tool stacking or finger weeders or whatever else, like get yourself um, some parallel linkages so, uh, and gauge wheels so that your your tools are following the contour of the ground. Or what I'm saying is take care of the basics first. Um, and then after that, think about tool stacking. Um, but in terms of resources, sure. Um, Brian Brown, who's at um, uh, Cornell, he, he did a lot of work on tool stacking. So feel free to look him up or get a hold of him. He's a great resource. 
Um, and then also the three companies that do a fair amount with tool stacking, in my opinion, would be Cult Crest, um, would be Stekety, which is now um, bought up by Lemkin, um, and then would also be Hawk. Um, so feel free to get a hold of those reps or um, look up, you know, on their websites or YouTube, and you can see a lot of examples of tool stacking. And one other question, maybe just I, Justin's probably going to address this, but what's your like if you were going to buy one cultivating tractor? What would it be? Oh man! Now wait, is this just like personal, like trivia about Sam, or is this like <laughs> which one for a reason? Um, could be well, either. anyhow. Um, maybe two thoughts, and I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the screen and pull up uh, my presentation again just to show a picture. Um, so hopefully you guys can see this and hopefully I have the picture. Okay. Um, so hopefully this is coming up. Um, one thing I would really consider is a rear mounted steerable toolbar. If you can see this, the reason, um, they have pros and cons, but some of the pros are, you know, on the older belly mount tractors, how you can easily run out of space for tools, especially if we're talking about stacking tools and a rear mounted tool, you have all the space in the world. Um, so that's one thing that's nice about them. Um, the other thing, it's kind of the strength is their weakness. It takes two people to run, right? So you need someone back here steering it, unless you buy a camera for it, which you can do. Um, and you need someone driving the tracker. So on the one hand, that's double the labor bill. But on the other hand, um, you can also go a lot faster because one person's in charge of the tractor and one person's in charge of steering. So in terms of um, tight windows and getting fields weeded um, before or after a rain, uh, rear mounted tool can be nice. The other thing, Again, uh, different strengths, weaknesses. One thing that's nice is they can go on a lot of different tractors as long as the wheel spacing works out. So if you have a tractor breakdown, if you need to rent a tractor or borrow one from a neighbor, your rear mounted steerable toolbar is gonna be fine. Whereas if your Alice G or Super C breaks down, you can't just move that toolbar over to something else. So the um, that's my maybe informative answer to your question. And maybe the shorter, cheekier answer is I would get whatever cultivating tractor runs well. You know, again, because so many of these cultivating tractors are 50, 70 years old, and when you need them, they don't run. And so, like, whatever is running well, and you can get spare parts for that's what I would get. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, Justin, you're up. Well, that was great, Sam. Thanks for putting that together. It's nice. I feel like cultivation things are kind of out of fashion right now. So, it's nice to see what the what's been coming along in the last 10, 15 years. Um, I, I was saying before most people showed up, you're like, I've been farming for 20 years and my first 10 years, all I did was sit on cultivating tractors like Kubota L245s, John Deere 900, H, you know, like the 30, 25 horsepower tractors that a lot of people are familiar with in the world of cultivation. And um, I completely agree with Sam. Like if they're still around 30, 40 years later, they obviously work okay. So find one that's, at the level of beaten up that you can afford and, uh, and then optimize it so that you actually use it. Um, so I started off doing tons of cultivation on, you know, those smaller, mostly the diesel powered ones. I never worked on the farms that had a lot of old internationals, but since then uh, in the evolution of our own farm over the last 15 years, we've actually moved away from the small cultivating tractors. And here I'll just, I'll share my screen. How do I get this thing down? It's blocking my. Oh, yeah, that's annoying, isn't it? I'll get it. Or we can just watch. So since some of you have been to our farm, but we farm about six miles, over six miles of the valley we live in. And it's a 25 to 100 mile an hour stretch of road, depending on the operators of the vehicles. So we've moved away from small, you know, 1800 pound tractors for reasons of A, road speed and be danger. Um, you can imagine if a F-150 comes up and hits you from behind at 45 miles an hour and you're driving Alice Chalmers G at eight miles an hour, you are dead. Whereas we do now our cultivation with tractors that weigh at least eight, 9,000 pounds, which is technically overkill for the horsepower requirements, but it makes me feel a lot better for myself and my coworkers health when they're driving down the road at in a tractor that actually weighs more than a pickup truck. Um, you can argue with that logic if you want, but it, I've been passed so unsafely so many times that I feel 100% confident that I do not mind 
running these oversized tractors. And also, if we're cultivating 120 hours a year, I'd be surprised. So it's really not that much of a you know overuse of diesel, and we're not racking up the hours on tractors that are unnecessarily large. Um, so we don't use those belly mount tractors like Kubot L245s and Case 265s and IH 274s. So we have to fabricate our own ways to put mid mount or front mount implements on so we've converted three tractors over to having front three-point hitches and the ones that we like best are the zweedbergs that come out of i think they're dutch isn't that right sam yeah i think they're i don't think they're german i think they're dutch but they're not free so that's the downside but um if you, if you go over to europe you'll see how many tractors have front three-point hitches because they're super useful for many things including cultivation so i'll just go up to the top so we moved over front hitches for road speed and fuel distance because I can drive 24 miles an hour down the road in some of our tractors and you have cultivators in the front and the rear and then you can do the cultivation in the field at four or five miles an hour. So it's a pretty fast, you know, like three acre per hour cultivation typically. And, you know, we're farming about 25 acres of vegetables, about nine of that is plastic culture and the rest is mostly what would be considered extremely low intensity row spacing. We do everything that's not plastic culture or high density greens. We do everything on 36 inch row spacing. That's sweet corn, brassicas. We even do carrots on 36 inch row spacing just because all of our equipment is set up to cultivate that. So sure, we might put in two thirds of an acre of carrots that could fit in one third of an acre, but we A, have the land and B, are set up to cultivate better on that more extensive spacing. Um, and then as Sam said about those rear cultivator, rear steerable cultivators, if you mount something off the front, you have a little bit more room to work with. There's some downsides to steering, obviously, if you're, you know, if your rear axles, your fulcrum and your front axles, your steering axles, if you have an implement out in front of you, it's going to wander a bit if you're sloppy with your steering. So you can kind of overcorrect in a pretty nasty way, but I do almost all the cultivation here and I've figured it out, I guess. So it's not, we're not suffering too much iron blight in most fields due to the, the wagging of the front ends of the tractors and then also those th front three-point hitches are super useful for snow plowing putting forklift attachments rock boxes quick attach weight blocks so we can actively ballast our tractors much better than if you know you just got 800 pounds on the front all the time uh, you can see in this picture here this is how we plow snow and if anybody hates plowing snow, they should really get a front hitch because with a snow pusher, you can just drop it down. It follows the ground and you don't have to, you don't snag buckets or anything. But this hitch on this tractor was $5,000 and that was like seven or eight years ago. So your guess is as good as mine what it would cost now. Um, but again, they're very, very, very useful tools that especially if you don't have a whole fleet of machines, it makes each one a little bit more versatile. Um, this is a picture of one of the two tractors we mostly do our cultivation with. We do are on 72 inch tire centers since we're on 36 inch row spacing. So there's two rows underneath each tractor. And I've modified a bunch of like I and J style parallelogram cultivators to be run from behind. So you can see on the front of this deer, the cultivator is oriented the same way as the rear cultivator, but I've had to extend out a false hitch three feet behind it so it pushes the cultivator far enough away from the tractor and for for two reasons it we often are cultivating you know pretty late into the season just because we because we can you might be behind um and we have tractors about 27 inches of, butt, of belly clearance so it's you can get into corn that's two feet tall pretty easily so we're working on making more high clearance cultivators like this one on the front of this deer right here is actually not very high clearance it's probably maybe 13 14 inches but right there we have, okay, yeah, so that is, this is the same shot. And these are finger weeders on, I guess what Sam was referring to as like vibra shanks. So our soil, we're not laser level. Um, our fields are not on hills, but they're all like paleo floodplains with some undulations and there are veins of rocks in most of the fields. So I do like having something that can kind of like bounce itself out of the way as opposed to hitting a rock super rigidly. So we have all of our finger weeders mounted on these um, s tines which do vibrate nicely our soil doesn't really crust so we actually can run finger weeders without anything in front of them they do work better if there's some tool loosening the soil right here kind of under the teeth but we get pretty good weed control even having the um finger weeders be the first thing out in front of the tractor you can see right over here gauge wheels as sam said 
I, I don't know how you cultivate without gauge wheels unless you are laser level. You know, like I said, we are not. This is a pretty standard INJ rear three-point hitch cultivator. Again, we're converting some of these to higher clearance yet because right here, the lift arms actually hit the tops of crops sometimes. So we're getting ones that have about eight inches more clearance and I have one in the shop right now that we're putting together. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But we have not spent a lot of money on cultivation equipment. Um, probably the best investment you can make in cultivation equipment is just like having the correct wrenches on the tractor at all times and remembering that your butt does not have velcro on it get off the tractor adjust get off adjust every day is different conditions i'm constantly raising cultivators up a half inch down a half inch to suit conditions soil type and crop stage i'm moving tines in and out um, but we still rely pretty heavily on s tines just because of the nature of our soil and we found a pretty good way to make them work well, taking another thing Sam was talking about with the, uh, let's see, no, I'll get to that in a second, but we use peanut sweeps on a lot of our S times. We don't use the goose foot shovels, which are a pretty good way to make a three inch deep furrow, but they don't really do a great job of uprooting shallow weeds. So we replace all S times with like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 inch wide, very flat sweeps that run very shallowly and don't throw a whole ton of soil. And you can have a shank in the center and have action five inches away from the center of the shank if you have 10 inch wide sweeps on there. Um, one interesting new tool we tried out last year on Skip Paul's recommendation, I think Skip sent this call, is we got some of these budding plastic trim cone weeders, I believe they're called. So everybody knows when you're cultivating plastic, the soil plastic interface is kind of the trickiest thing to manage so we have sweeps down here further away from the plastic and then these cones are just bent spring steel that ride you can actually have them pressing against the plastic and they just crumble all the they crumble and kind of throw around all the clumps of soil that are along the plastic they're not 100 percent effective but they're the best thing we found for getting really close and they won't rip up your plastic like a spider gang will which is what a lot of folks use close to their plastic or a lilliston um, so again, this is another tool and, you know, those require a lot of adjustment constantly, but I don't know about you guys, but we farm in a rainforest here. So it's pretty much always too wet. So I do a lot of cultivation at like four in the afternoon after it rained an inch of rain, you know, 18 hours before. Um, so it, it's a lot of dealing with wet soils, but our soils are pretty well drained. So we can almost always stay on top of it. Um, but I, I, I have everything designed to be kind of as fast as we can go so I can get, you know, eight acres done in you know a two, three hour window in the afternoon when the ground is fit. But budding is only, i sorry, I forgot the H on budding. That might've been autocorrect. Uh, budding, I don't, I don't even know to what extent they actually exist anymore, but you can email the guy who used to own it and he'll make you stuff. But they're, I don't know if the company is actually still extant in a proper form, but they used to make the original finger weeders from the eighties that a lot of folks were used to from steel in the field. I think they lost a lot of market share to some of the European brands and Tillmore over the last couple of years. Um, but they still make nice stuff. They're not cheap, but they're really well built. And that's just a picture of, I think this is the first day I put these on. So they eventually got moved closer to the plastic. You can see the one on the driver's left is probably three inches too far away from the plastic, but it does a good job of, as long as you don't let the weeds get ahead of you, it does a really good job of crumbling that soil and killing white thread weeds, which is, or we should all be worrying on worry about killing anyway. Uh, just another picture of a cheaper front three-point hitch system that I got for like 300 bucks off Craigslist a bunch of years ago. It's a Buckeye from the 90s. It doesn't work that great, but it's 300 bucks. So it went on that tractor because the tractor is not even worth as much as a Zweedberg front hitch would be. Um, but the nice Zweedberg front hitches with the Walter Scheid hook ends are really nice for quick on and off of implements. So Justin, here is will just, you just will you just say another note about the Walter Scheid hook ends to make sure people know because those are yeah I don't know if you look all right so if you look at my don't look at the screen look at me if you can see me instead of the captured ball which a three point hitch end typically is and you put the clevis through it or the hitch pin Walter Scheid balls are kind of like a claw with a spring loaded tab. So you actually go underneath your hitch pin, which has a ball on it, and it clicks in place. And so you can hitch up the lower three-point hitch arms without getting off the tractor if you're pretty good at backing up, which as vegetable farmers, we should be. We should be able to win the Olympics for hitching and unhitching implements. Um, and then when you want to undo it, you just pull up on this release tab and it drops the ball. They're 
so nice. And it's like the standard way three point hitches come in Europe. I don't know about South America, but if you hitch up implement slot, it's, it, it's, it's, it's so night and day better for the most part. And then you just have to make sure all your implements have ball spacing at the same width and then all your tractors become standardized and you can just hitch things up much, much, much easier. And if you combine that with a hydraulic top link, which actually doesn't help you with hitching, but it helps a lot with adjusting your cultivators. Thank you, Sam. Uh, here's another picture of just weird stacking that we'll do. So this is pre-emergence cultivation of potatoes. We grow about five or six acres of potatoes. And I pretty much spend all summer focusing on potatoes because um, they are our most management sensitive crop. So I you know, feel like it's worth my time. So on this tractor here, we're driving over unemerged rows of potatoes and I have finger weeders going in the front. Um, our planter does a slight hill, which we will then knock down with a tine weeder. And then this is the second cultivation pre-emergence. So we'll use the uh, finger weeders in the front, some S tines, and then in the back we have a Lely tine weeder adjusted to run slightly shallower right over the rows. Um, so you know we're doing a little bit of that stacking that Sam was mentioning. So that's just a, you can see sort of uh, after a second pass the hills that were formed by our planter are more or less knocked down, and I think we're probably within you know three or four days of some potatoes popping up here. And this is an uh, this is a Laley tine weeder where you can adjust each tine's aggressiveness individually. Um, some of the other brands you kind of adjust them all, or it's a it's a slightly more challenging um, individual adjustment. But the Laley works really well for doing a single bed at a time. And then in the world of stacking, we've now bought some of these Tillmore T Sin tine weeders, which will mount on the rear of our three point hitch parallelogram cultivators. So we'll have S tines in front of these. And then we can have these adjustable tiny weeders running behind. And I don't think we'll run these all the time. They're going to be easy to take on and off. Um, but in those moments when you know, like, you maybe you're three, four days too late on cultivation because of weather or whatever, it's just a way to get that much more aggressive on our cultivations when our windows are fit. And then also we'll use these without the S times to rake and cover crop seed because we're working on building a cover crop interseeder to drop. Um, oats and rye and so on in September into standing crops like fall brassicas. And we're even going to experiment a little bit with some of our fall um, carrots, just because we, we have almost 100% cover crop coverage come November 1st, but some of those late harvested brassicas are a little bit of a challenge. And if we have a clean crop of corn, we can just drop cover crop seed in there and maybe get away with even avoiding a tillage pass. But we'll see, we're going to experiment with some of that stuff. But in our sort of more extensive bed spacing, it does open up the opportunities for more intercrop seeding. So we're going to play with that a little bit, talk to me in five years, see how we like it and what are the strengths and weaknesses. But I think it's a good opportunity in, in our system. Um, and then last year we did build, not exactly cultivation, but this is our Oh, so it rained 10 inches every month all summer, and we definitely have more weed escapes than we'd like to have. Um, we have a nice new two-row flame weeder um, with depth skids, so we can even flame the sides of standing potatoes. Um, this will probably come into effect over the next couple of years, too, in terms of controlling potato beetles. Um, I know the Gorensons over in, new in Maine and some other folks have built, um, like what... Uh, John Cohen built for knocking potato beetles off of plants, but rather than collecting them in Rubbermaid tubs, knocking the potato beetles off into a furrow and then flaming that furrow behind the tractor. So this is our what we're going to probably be moving into over the coming years, because as everyone knows, none of the organic insecticides work terribly well on potato beetles, which aren't a huge problem for us in general. But one of these years it will be and I want to be ready. So that's all I got there. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or any thoughts on cultivation. Hey, that was great, Justin. This is Byrne. Is that, are you saying the flaming is your rescue? I was wondering like, yeah, when you can't get in and they're all way ahead of you, what are your, what are your metal rescue tools? Just go in with the big sweeps or what do you do? I mean, our primary, if it's that bad, our primary rescue tools are hose. Um, but before I ever started this farm, like I said, I just rolled cultivating tractors all the time. So I've always been extremely concerned with making sure weeds don't get too big. So we don't, we started off on a farm that was fine sandy loam that had been in hay for decades. So we did not inherit an annual weed seed problem and I've worked really hard to not generate one. Some years are more successful than others. 
Um, but we also have 10 acres more in cultivation than we need any one year. So if we do have a field that gets a bad weed problem one year, we'll just take it out of production the next year, do a succession of cover crops and tillage. And it's pretty amazing what that does to get your weed seed banked down from year to year. But the main thing is just being able to hit the ground running fast. Like I can cultivate all the plastic in a day if I have to. I don't like cultivating that much in a day. It's kind of hard on the knees. But the flamer is more for in like potatoes after you've already hilled up, you kind of don't have any tools left anymore. And if just the way the hilling and the rains work in late June, I want to be able to come in before the rows completely close and just flame the sides of those hills to get any weeds that have germinated. Because in potatoes, there's no way you're going to only cultivate the top inch of soil. You're literally throwing inches and inches on top of the hill. So you are bringing up weed seeds through the entire cultivation process. So if your hilling lines up poorly with weather, um, that's where the flamer will come in on potatoes to just help clean that field up before the rows close. Even S, if you could repeat the ball hitch name. Uh, they're called Walter Scheid. So Walter and then S-C-H-E-I-D. But if you just look at a tractor listing on any website in Europe, look at their three-point hitch arms and that's what they are. Walter Scheid is one word. They actually make a lot of PTO shafts too. So it's it's a German brand that's it's over here, but it doesn't have the retail presence that some others would. But you can buy the ball, you can buy the hook ends, cut your ball ends off and weld them on if you, you know, if you want. Or you can buy entire three point hitch assemblies or just import European tractors. But the front hitches all come with them because it's just because you can't see your front hitch ball ends. So there's really, it's, it's a lot harder without, without the Walter Scheid ends. Dan just followed up on your comment asking what cover crops do you use to bring the weed pressure down in the fields that got away from you? I think I'm of the opinion that the cover crop doesn't matter as much as the tillage passes between the cover crops. I think that's my rough impression is like, I know some, you know, cover crops definitely suppress weeds better than others, but suppressing doesn't often mean killing. So I think it's, you know, if we had, a, if we had a feel that I know, we had more lambs quarters escapes the previous year. Like we'll come in with definite May tillage and then a cover crop of something quick, like oats, maybe in April. And then in late June, disc that under when all those lambs quarters are really germinating, plant buckwheat for four weeks, kill that, and then go into a rye cover crop in the fall. And those three tillage passes seem to do a really good job of getting rid of them. But this is not a situation where it's like a carpet of lambs quarters going to seed. I don't know how you rescue that, but if it's, you know, I don't like to look out on a field of winter squash and see any weeds sticking out above the canopy, but you know, you're going to have some that are below and it kind of helps with those. But one thing I might add there is just consider or be aware of if your problem weeds are annuals or perennials. So okay. like perennial thistles or, or just perennials in general, um, it can be really helpful to mow. So something like sorghum Sudan that in terms of the management, you're going to mow, you're knocking that perennial back anyway. But just, just to say, uh, be aware of if your weed problem are annual or perennial because it can be helpful to choose your cover crop accordingly. Yeah, we're, we're full tillage. So we have um, zero perennial <laughs> weed problems. We're, we're fully annuals here. And then we have, you know, I mean, how many growers here have like oak leaf goose foot as a weed? Like that's a weed that doesn't even exist in like the weed books. And it's like so many... Vermont farms on sandy loam soils, like sandy loam rainforest soils seem to just sprout goosefoot like nothing. So, but it's never a crop I felt has ever like smothered a crop. So it's kind of present, but not wildly problematic, but I'm also not a uh, salad green grower for the most part. There's and a couple, um, I think you already answered this, Justin, but um Howard was wondering if you rehill your potatoes after your last cultivation. We, so our cultivation, potato procession is planting with a cup planter that does make a slight hill, knock that down twice with a tine weeder. Doesn't get it fully, fully flat, but it does, it's pretty aggressive. And then we'll hill twice after that. Um, and that usually is, you know, around June 15th and then June 23rd. And then basically by July 1 in most varieties, we have row closure. So we don't come in again. But I would say if we did, like I said, if the timing worked out terribly, that we were ready to hill and then the rains came, we'd, we'd, I'm, I'm going to work on a system with the flame weeder because we have it. 
you know, and if you're killing weeds that are this big that you can, you can just see a fuzz on the side of the hill, I think the flame weeder would do a pretty good job there. Thanks, Justin. Um, here's a big question for both of you, but could you discuss flipping beds in a way that doesn't bring up seed, like new weed seeds? I'll start only because I have very little to say, Justin, and hopefully you can give a better better answer. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, we're talking about depth and bringing up new weed seeds. One, in terms of harvest, if it's any type of root crop, you're you're going deeper than two inches. Um, and then often for preparing a new seed bed, you're going deeper than an inch or two, you know, to, to um, break down soil aggregates and make a nice seed bed. So the one thing I can offer there is if you can give yourself a little time to do even a short, stale seed bedding, you know, prep that seed bed, either water it or have a nice packer right behind the tiller or whatever to make that good weed seed soil contact. You know, if you can give yourself even a few days to till again shallowly before you plant, you can work some of those seeds out. That's all I got. Yeah, we don't do a lot of, you know, four six sessions per bed type stuff. Like the only things we kind of do anything like that would be we do some baby spinach, which we'll usually double crop a year. But it's not on this super fast turnaround where we're trying to flip a bed and, you know, transplant something else in there three days later. So we'll come through usually after a spinach crop and hit it with a high speed disc which only works three inches deep, but then it sits for two weeks before we see it again, three weeks before we see it again. So we do have that opportunity. We're not, it's, I mean, it's a pretty messy stale seed, but if you're going three inches, but you have to incorporate that residue, sprout some weeds, hit it with a bed shaper and then plant again. So we're not, yeah, it's a little more time intensive and space intensive than in some of the smaller market farm style um, bed transition techniques which i think that's why a lot of folks have gone to tarps because it's a great way to if you have like a week or two two weeks of time you can just kill everything without even disturbing anything but we, we don't we don't do any tarping just because of scale problems yeah i guess i would also say adding to that particularly understanding like sam mentioned the weed ecology. So if there's one particular weed that's causing a problem with the bed flipping at a certain time of year, like if it's the goosefoot lamb supporters or whatever, crabgrass, um, to that can like dictate a little bit of that practice, you know, tarping doesn't work for every weed, but most weeds. So yeah. I think, I think a big, um, kind of question lingering too is like the transfer ability of the practices you both discussed so well to slightly smaller scales. I think there's often that like three to four acre farm that doesn't have the mechanical setup, but is too big to be out there hand weeding. So maybe that's where Tillmore comes in. Um, we didn't show any pictures of two wheel tractors, but for people at that scale, whether it's a brand new Tillmore Power Ox, I think they're maybe like three thousand ish dollars or something, um, or a refurbished Planet Junior tractor that I've got them for fifty bucks at an auction. You got to fix them up a little. But those two wheel tractors, and like Justin showed, a lot of his tools from Tillmore, you can get brand new tooling for those. The two wheel, every everything we talked about, the principles can be adapted to two wheel tractors. Yeah, thank you for addressing that. I think that often kind of scaling it down is is hard to conceptualize, but is very possible. And like you said, the um, principles are the same. Sam, there's a question for you in the chat from Ian. Any thoughts on the Colt Next Generation parallelograms for a belly mount toolbar? Sure. Um, first general thought is um, accept your limitations in, in belly mount. And so like, so you're belly mounted. Okay. And you want to have gauge wheels. I assume that's why you're um, considering the, the next gen setup. Great. If you're going to do gauge wheels on belly mount, um, as far as I know, you have like three options. You can do the Colt Crest next gen setup. You can do the Stekety, um setup from Sutton Ag, and they do that you know regularly and can help you do that. Or you can do the original Planet Junior Cultivators, which had the, the gauge wheels too. Um but the limitation is in, in belly mount with gauge wheels, which is great because now they're all responding, you just have less space. So my thoughts are the, the next gen tool, I think is a great tool. It's super adjustable. Um, so even like the, um, you can get a spring for the parallel linkage to either give yourself more down pressure or less, depending on your soil. Um, the main body of the 
tool you can shove forward or back so that you know a lot of those tractors you run out of space further back towards the operator but you've got more belly space you know front towards the front wheels so they're great in that they're adjustable like that um maybe the kind of solution that i would offer is the the cult parallelograms or any other um parallel linkage accept the limitation that it's not going to be great for later stages um, especially because those ones are meant to run over the row, right? So that's great. That's why they're as accurate, but they're right over the row. So you run out of space. So maybe get yourself another toolbar, me meaning you could use the cult crest stuff when the crops are young, you need to be really um, accurate, but then you can get like Justin showed a picture of his maybe two inch square toolbar with some S tines on them. You know, you could put rolling baskets or spider weeders or whatever, you, you know, for probably less than 500 bucks um, used. But so if you have two, two, two toolbars, use the cult crest for what it's good at when they're young. And when stuff starts getting big, instead of trying to force it and breaking leaves and everything, slap another toolbar on there. You won't be as accurate, but at that stage of crop growth, hopefully you don't need to be. And then you'll just have more space, you know, to, to give the crops the space they need. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, I just to add to that too, I really think nobody's ever accused me of not spending enough money on like iron but I do not spend much money on cultivation equipment. We are very low tech. It's low tech plus 7018 welding rod in the shop. So, I mean, you don't have to be super shiny. Like there's actually not paint on most of my cultivation equipment because it's shop built and I don't get around to painting it. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is scalable down to like anything involving a four wheel tractor. It's just, you might have to do two passes because you don't have a front hitch. But if you do one pass with your tractor with one set of influence and then come back with another set an hour later, that's actually great. You know, those weeds might've dried out a teeny bit and then you just hit them again. And so stacking doesn't have to be this fancy thing where you spend $80,000 on a tractor that can hold these things for your five acres. Like, like Sam said, spend $600 on some steel and a couple, you know, like just the business end of the cultivators aren't that expensive. Most, most of the weight of a cultivator is just supporting steel. So you can do that, you know, on a much lower budget than many other tools that we need for our business. That's a really and, helpful perspective. Thank you. There's no really reason fun. to have Like building stuff is fun. You know, solving problems is fun. And welding is fun. So we, we have to have this series sponsored by 7018 Welding Rod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Lincoln. <laughs> I, I will say I'm not a very good welder, but I was able to take a a uh, welding class at the high school and you can i mean that's like a great use of the horse and make cultivation tools in there so um i i am aware of the time sam i don't know if you are i think you're consulting so if um you want to pop your email or i can share it out if you make yourself available to growers um sure sure i'll put my email in the thank in you the for chat. generously offering your time today and your knowledge and justin thank you for making it look so easy. N not a weed in any of those photos. And we hide those we'll pictures, Becky, you know that. <laughs> um, we'll post it's... the recording in slides too, so. You have to watch Justin's edible weed talk to see those. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you both. That was information filled and really, really helpful. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks everybody. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Bye.